Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be in church today. Whoop. Awesome. Uh, well, hello and welcome to Lifeline Church once again. My name is Tiffany. My husband, Elliot, and I get the great honor and privilege of being able to pastor this group of Lifeline group of people <laughs> called Lifeline Church. Go ahead and celebrate yourselves. Let's give it up. Because it's good. We made it. It's like 100 and something degrees outside already, and we are here. Praise the Lord. Uh, a couple of things are happening in our community at this moment. So uh, actually, since Wednesday, we've been running a fireworks booth over there in between BevMo and Applebee's. Whoop, whoop. And we have got an amazing team who's doing a killer rock star job. Can we just celebrate everyone who's, who's given up time and working in that booth? Especially yesterday and today, because it's over 100, man. So anybody who stopped by and, and brought ice or Gatorades, you guys are also rock stars. We appreciate that. If you are buying fireworks and you haven't bought them yet, go to the booth in between BevMo and Applebee's. Um, and then also, I'm, this is this is the last plug, but if you're a, a, a male <laughs> and you got, you got strong arms and a, a great back and you got nothing to do at 11 o'clock, then you can find Steven and you can meet him over at the storage trailer because we need some fireworks to load. Uh, so if you've got some free time and you're like, yeah, I want to help, but I just didn't know where to sign up. Today is your day. Uh, Steven's wearing a red lifeline shirt. You can connect with him and you'd love that. Uh, before we do anything else, I want to bring your attention to next week. Next week, we are starting at the movies. It's going to be amazing. If you haven't experienced that yet, it's okay. Next year when it comes around, you'll be like, yes, it's amazing. It starts next week. It's four weeks of at the movies. So Lifeline Church is going to the movies. We're going to have, we, I, we already got it all purchased. We got Monsters. We got Dr. Pepper. We got Diet Pepsi. We got all the, all the things and all the snacks. So at 930 in the morning, you're ready to go. <laughs> but it's amazing. We take, I'm not going to explain it to you. We're just going to show you a teaser trailer. But before we do that, we've been handing out these cards and it's also been available on social media. People are finding it. And already 39 people who are not a part of Lifeline Church, who don't call Lifeline Church home, we don't know whether or not they're in a relationship with Jesus or not, but they have planned their visits. They are planning to come next week. So next week, I'm telling you, Lifeline Church, that's amazing. You celebrate. But bring your A game because it's on you to be warm and welcoming and to go first and engage people and make people feel like this is their home. Amen. We, we believe in you guys. It's going to be amazing. So uh, without any further ado, though, I want to give you guys the teaser trailer so you can get ready for next week. Lifeline Church, welcome to At The Movies. This is the, one of the most exciting series we do all year long. And this is a series where we use modern day parables to communicate biblical truths. I'm so excited because this is a great opportunity for you to invite your friends and family. I promise you they've never seen anything like this before. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to allow these movies and these parables to let you see the gospels, to see God's truth, like a pair of 3D glasses getting put on for you to be able to see God's truths in a brand new way. I believe he'll transform your heart and transform your understanding about the word of God. So from all of us here, welcome to Lifeline and welcome to At The Movies. It's going to be so much fun, so don't miss that or all four weeks. And amazing movies. I mean, Rogue One, I'm like, yeah, this is a great, that's a great film. Um, all right, well, enough about that. We are in a series called Trinity. We're talking about the Trinity because our God is a, he's one God, three persons. He describes that himself that way in the Bible. And many of us are familiar with God the Father. Uh, many of us are familiar with Jesus the Son. And today we get to talk about the Holy Spirit. Woo woo! Um, so I'm super excited about that. We're going to dive uh, in pretty soon. But if you came in and you got one of these, this is a bulletin inside there. You can find fill in the blank notes. So if you're a note taker, go ahead and pull that out uh, and you can follow along. You can also bring that up on the YouVersion Bible app. So if you already have the Bible app, you can pull that up and fill in the blanks there as well. Um, so today, like I said, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but no doubt, say the word spirit and varied images come to people's mind. I mean, in our day and age, there's all kinds of stuff on TV, and we have a hungry generation. We've got a hungry generations of people who are looking for something supernatural, looking for something powerful, looking for something that's, we, we know 
this from scripture. Scripture says that we were created for eternity. So whether or not you believe that, there is something inside each and every one of us that something calls out to us. Something bigger than me exists. And we put words on it. We put labels on it. We, we push ourselves away from conventional Christianity or religion or some kind of box, but our hearts and our minds and our spirits are open uh, to something else. We're open to something bigger. And so when we say the word spirit, um, even if we know the Lord, even if we've grown up in church, we, we have ideas of what the spirit realm looks like, of what spirits are and what they do. So for some, spirit is just synonymous with haunted mansions. Like there is nothing good that comes from a spirit. It's sc scary, run away, or jump right in because it's fascinating. Like, I don't know who you are. You know, there's, there's different types of people. Uh, for others, it refers to some kind of cosmic life force. You know, may the force be with you. Uh, like it's, it's interwoven th through everything. Um, but for those of us who are committed to biblical truth where we're looking at the scriptures and the scriptures are speaking to us, uh, there's, there's primarily three types of spirits that we find within scripture. One of, that, one of those are the unclean demonic forces, which you can read about in scripture. And Jesus talks to them. He talks directly to them. And he's the one who he casts out those unclean forces that, that take over a person and they exist. And then there's no, another type of spirit that we read about in scriptures is that part of man or that part of humans. Um, that God most intimately communicates with. It's that, that undercurrent in our life, which actually comes to life when we meet the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that later. And then number three, there's the, the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Godhead. He's the third person in the Trinity. Uh, and he's the one who primarily empowered the, the life and the ministry of Jesus. And when you, when you understand the Holy Spirit and you begin to open up the scriptures and you look for the Spirit in action, you can see him all over the life of Jesus. And you can see him all over the life of the apostles and the disciples who went out after him. So I, I want to talk about primarily to set up the Holy Spirit, I want to talk about the importance of the Spirit in Jesus' life. And, and I want to talk about the fact that Jesus' life is noted by the fact that Jesus begins his public ministry with the reception of the Spirit. So when we read about all the miracles and Jesus going out and, and he preaches and he teaches with power and authority and people, have you guys ever seen The, the Chosen, that series The Chosen? That's not, if you haven't seen it, they take creative license, but it's also very cool because we read the stories um, but we forget that these are people and so they, they they create some backstory that may or may not be you know biblical within scripture but what's fascinating is that you begin to relate with real life people who encountered Jesus the the creator of the universe as a person uh, and it'll profoundly change change our hearts but Jesus ministry was empowered by the person of the Holy Spirit so so when people were interacting with him and there was life change it was the spirit of the living God that was calling out to the spirit that God placed within humanity that was going I want that there's something that that desire for for more that desire to connect with something bigger than myself is found within the person of the Holy Spirit so Luke describes Jesus as being filled with the Holy Spirit and also describes him as ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself, when, when Jesus talks and they, you know, they see his power, they see his miracles, Jesus attributes everything about who he is to the power and the work of the Holy Spirit within his life. Uh, so Jesus is always, always glorifying the Spirit. And I, I'm bringing that up because a lot of times I've grown up in church um, and so I, 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 you know, I go, not that I fully understand the Trinity because you say God had three persons and it's still like, what? <laughs> but there's, a, there's an element of faith going, something has resonated with something inside of me and so I don't understand it all, but there's a faith and a belief that that is real and that is good and it sits right in my heart, it sits right in my spirit. We say Trinity, um, we, we're, we're okay with God the Father, we're okay with God the Son, and some of us are okay with the Holy Spirit, but still he's kind of over here and I don't understand him. So I'll let him do his thing, but I don't really want to interact with them, you know, <laughs> or I don't fully understand who he is and how he operates. And so there's an element of spirituality. There's an element of this Christian walk that may be missing in our lives because we, we don't understand who the Holy Spirit is. And so I want to talk about that today. Who is this person who empowered Jesus and who he passed on to his followers? What are his specific attributes, because we know about the Father, we know about the Son, what are the specific attributes of the Holy Spirit? And then 
Uh, Pastor Elliot has used this verse every week, and so we'll get into it again. But why did Jesus term the Holy Spirit another helper? And then what is his personal relationship to us as believers? So today I want to do two things primarily. One, I want us to look at the person of the Holy Spirit. I want, to, I want us to have a full understanding of who he is and how he operates. And then number two, I want us to look at our personal relationship to him. Like, what's my relationship with the Spirit? And what is, can, can I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Is that a thing? Uh, I want to talk about that. So the first thing we're going to do is just talk about understanding the Spirit. So if you're taking notes, you can write this in. The Holy Spirit is an intelligent person. I want us to understand that the Holy Spirit is an intelligent person. He's not a wild, rambling fool, uh, and he's not a cosmic life force. He's an intelligent person. So John 15, 26, we're going to write to Scripture. And this is the one we've been looking at. Jesus says to his followers, I will send you the Advocate. Another word for advocate, you, and it's translated in vari various words in different translations, but I will send you the comforter, I will send you the counselor, I will send you the encourager, or I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. And he will come to you from the Father, and he will testify all about me. So we just read over scripture. And so what I want us to see here is that Jesus calls him the spirit of truth, and I want you to notice that he speaks. It says, he will testify all about me. To testify, you have to open up your mouth and speak words. So the Holy Spirit is an intelligent person because he's called the spirit of truth, which is, in, there's intelligence there, and then he speaks. And then Acts 13, 2, another scripture, uh, he says, one day as these men, so it's the apostles, after Jesus ascended, the disciples became known as the apostles. The apostles are together. They're praying, and they're asking the Lord, what are we supposed to be doing? Uh, and they're praising and glorifying God. And it says, one day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Notice that the Holy Spirit speaks. It says, the Holy Spirit said. They didn't say the Father said. They didn't say Jesus said. They said the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So why don't you notice it was the apostles heard from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says, I have a special work that I have appointed them to do. So equal to the Father and Son, he has power and authority to call and appoint and send for a work uh, that, that is within the Godhead. So it was the Holy Spirit who spoke to them, and he had a special job for Paul and Barnabas to do. You can write this down. We're just going to move kind of really quickly through understanding who the Spirit is. But the Holy Spirit demonstrates emotion and exercises will. So you can write those in. He demonstrates emotion, and he exercises will. We're, we're giving validity to him as a person. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says this. Not that he needs validity. He is who he is. It's our job to come to understand him, not make him make sense. Amen? That's part of being a Christian, we submit to the power and the authority because of faith in the living God, and he begins to reveal things to us. But 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says this, it is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So in Corinthians, he, the, Paul is writing, Paul is a spirit-filled man, and he's writing to the church in Corinth, and their, their spiritual gifts have broken out, and that's where a lot of people get weird, is these spiritual gifts, which I'm not even going to talk about today. We'll talk about that later, and I will get into it, and I'll show, I'll, I'll give you some information, but he's talking about the gifts that break out, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpreting uh, other languages, healing, uh, encouraging, all, hospitality, all the gifts. And, but he says to the church, he's trying to bring them some order. He says, it is the one and only spirit who distributes them all. So the spirit has power and authority to distribute those gifts. He alone decides. He alone decides, which means the Holy Spirit knows what you're going to need, when you're going to need it, and he decides what he's going to bless you with so that you can succeed in the life that God has called you to live. But it's the Holy Spirit who brings that gift. And so we have to be a little bit okay with who, not a little bit okay, we have to be a lot of it okay with if we love God the Father and we believe in Christ the Son, then we need to be open to receiving the Holy Spirit who becomes our comfort comforter, our counselor, the spirit of truth who is with us. People are hearing the word of God and they're getting saved. So it says 3,000 were added to their number. You can read the story. 3,000 were added to their number. And the Holy Spirit is, it's the Holy Spirit. He's doing a work in people's life and they're deciding to sell their belongings and their possessions. And they're giving, they're coming and they're laying money down at the feet of the apostles saying, I want to bless your work. I want to bless your ministry. I want in. I'm for you. I'm a part of this family. We're in this together. Now what happens is some people come and 
they sell their land and they lie about giving it all. Okay, and I love this. It says, what, okay, justice. What Acts 5, chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, Peter talks to this man. His name is Ananias. It says, then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? He says, you lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? And he says, you weren't lying to us, but to God. And so what matters there is Ananias, he, he, he pretended like he was giving all of the proceeds. And so that his sin was lying. But, and it was the Holy Spirit who quickened Peter's heart because there's no way Peter would have known how much his lot of land costed. But the Holy Spirit in him said, I'm being lied to. <laughs> the Holy Spirit within Peter said, I am being lied to. And so Peter spoke up and he said, Ananias, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And then down at the end, he says, you weren't lying to us, but to God. And so what we see here is the apostles, they equate the whole Holy Spirit with God. Ananias didn't lie to people. He lied to, to God. So that's where we see he, there's deity, attributes of deity assigned to him. He is one with God the Father. Okay, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this again, writing to the church, Peter, uh, Paul is writing, says, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. Ain't nobody know your secrets like you know your secrets, right? You're the only one inside of your head. Nobody else can get there. You have to invite somebody else into that space. The Holy Spirit is the only one who's invited into the deep secrets and all the thoughts of the living creator God. And then he says, but I'm giving him to you. So all those things inside my head that you can't possibly know because you don't live there, you can get them through my spirit, through my spirit, who's a gift to you. He's your counselor. He's your comforter. He's your advocate. He fights for you. He's going to deliver you the spirit of truth. He's going to give you truth. It's the spirit of the living God who does that. There are attributes of deity assigned to him. And so just for fun, I want to give you some of his New Testament names because I know you're so excited to go open up the scriptures. You're going to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're going to see where's the Holy Spirit at. And then you're going to read the rest of the New Testament, and you're going to see other words you and so I, I, want, I want to put these in there because when you read them, I want your, your spirit to be quick and go, that's the Holy Spirit. And I want us to be paying a little bit more attention to who he is and how he operates and what that looks like. So some of his New Testament names are Holy Spirit, Comforter. We've already said some of these. He's the Advocate, which means he fights for you. He's your Encourager. He'll be referred to as the Counselor. He's referred to as the Spirit of Christ. And he's referred to as the Spirit of God. And so we see that he, the Holy Spirit's all up, all up in the Trinity. <laughs> so we see then that the Holy Spirit, he's not a force. He's not some, he's not some force that has, has nothing. He is a person. He's got intelligence. He's got emotion. He's got will. He has ideas. He speaks. He interacts. There is a relationship that can be had with this person of the Holy Spirit. And just prior to his crucifixion, Jesus had a tremendous amount of concern for the welfare of, because Jesus knew, like, I love you all, but you fully don't know. He's talking to the disciples. You know, I love you all, but you still have no idea what the heck is going to happen. And when it does happen, you're not going to be fully prepared for all the things that are going to run through your mind. And so there was a, a tremendous amount of concern that Jesus had because he knew what was coming. And in John 14, 1, Jesus is talking to his disciples when his heart is full of concern. And he says to them beforehand, let not your heart be troubled. Those were his words of comfort, and it was followed by this promise. And so they had to hang on to that. And it came rushing back to them because the Holy Spirit reminds us of all the things that Jesus has ever said. <laughs> he is so good, the Holy Spirit. He's, in John 16, 6, Jesus says, I pray to the Father, and he is going to give you another helper that he may abide with or live with you forever. And so the Holy Spirit is going to live with the disciples, live with the followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's a promise that the Holy Spirit is going to abide with you forever. He will be with you always. And the preciousness of that promise comes from that word that we've talked about every week. It's a Greek word meaning another, and it's Alan or Alos sometimes. And this, it means one besides or another of, this, of the same kind. So in essence, Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you 
one besides me and in addition to me, but one just like me. And he's going to do in my absence what I would do if I were physically present with you. And it's in essence saying the Spirit's coming assures continuity with what Jesus did and taught. Because the Holy Spirit is going to continue the work of Jesus. And Jesus called people to do the work of the ministry. He called 12 disciples to follow him because it was on them that it was going to go. And then the church was going to continue to be built. And we are the church. We are the succession plan. And the Holy Spirit is God's gift to us to ensure that the life and the power of Jesus is alive and well within his church. Okay, so Jesus, and now what I want to talk about, Jesus says of the Holy Spirit, this is kind of the last portion in understanding the Spirit, but in John 14, verse 17, and in verse 26, there's a scripture, and I'm just, we're going to fill in the blanks of that scripture, okay? This is what Jesus says of the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of truth. Everybody say truth. His relationship to believers is that of dwelling in us. Everybody say in us. And then he's our advocate. Everybody say advocate. advocate. Means he fights for you. And then he will teach us all things. Everybody say teach. You ever feel like I just want to know some things? You know, like I just want to know I want to know the next right thing. I've got this thing going on in my life. My family's kind of falling apart. I'm having a hard time. And Jesus, I'm reading scripture. Father, I know that you love me, but I need to know some things. You want to know who's going to tell you some things? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the relationship and the openness to the person of the Holy Spirit who's going to show you some things, who's going to give you wisdom in organizing your life or give you the words to say or tell you to shut your mouth. <laughs> and just wait because I'm on the move and your words can't fix this, but my spirit will. Because in the same way I'm stirring your heart, I'm stirring their heart, and I just need you to be patient. It's the spirit of the living God. He will give us wisdom to do that. And he is with us. He fights for us. He is for us. Now let's talk about the Holy Spirit and his personal relationship to us or to you. So write this down. According to Jesus, according to Jesus, how does one meet the Holy Spirit? You're like, okay, that's great, but like, do I meet him? You know, because there's Father, Son. Let's talk about it. This is my favorite, John chapter three, verse five. Jesus is talking to, you guys remember or heard the story about Nicodemus. He's the Pharisee who follows Jesus in secret because he's afraid of everybody else, okay? And he's got power, he's got position, he's got status. If Nicodemus were to follow Jesus, he would be absolutely foolish and his life would be wrecked. So he does it in secret. Okay. And Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He says, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. So Jesus is talking to a spiritual leader named Nicodemus who is truly desiring to know more about God. And Nicodemus says this. He's like, what do you mean? Born of water? Like, you need me to go back in my mother's womb? <laughs> like, honestly. And this is old lingo that'll show up in church membership classes. Are you a born again Christian? And people ask, what does that mean? Are you a born again Christian? Because, I mean, your mom doesn't want you going back in her womb at the size you are, right? And some of us, like... Our, you know, our moms have passed. We can't even get back in there if we tried. You know, like, do I have any hope of getting into the kingdom of God? And, and so he says, no, you have to be born. It's, it's spirit of water and of spirit. And that just means when you, if you can remember back, if you've already given your life to Christ, there was a moment. And I keep using the word quicken, but it's like your heart raced. Something within you quickened. And it was like, you ever, you ever had words? You don't know the words, but you got thoughts in your mind. And then someone says those words. And you're like, yes, that, exactly, exactly that. And so that's what happens when, when the spirit, when we, when we meet Jesus, something happens and our heart goes, yes, yes, that. I don't understand it all, but you're putting words into my heart and into my life and into my mind that I didn't know I needed. And it's that. And that is faith. And that, that's, the, that's all it is. It's that initial encounter with Jesus where your heart is quickened and you say, yes, you have met the Holy Spirit. And so it's just that continual relationship and ongoing, immediately the Holy Spirit is with Jesus and so we receive him that way. So in essence, basically to meet the Holy Spirit, you have to be alive. <laughs> like you have to be a living body. You have to have come out of the womb and then you have to have just had an opportunity to meet Jesus. And in that opportunity to meet Jesus, you also were introduced to the person of the Holy Spirit. Your spirit came alive. You can, you can feel the wind, but you cannot see it. 
but you can see its effects. And so the Holy Spirit is the same way. You, you cannot see him. You don't know where he came from, but you can sense and see his effects in your life because he is with you. Now let's talk about the Holy Spirit is God's... Oh, nah, we're still in uh, the Spirit's personal relationship to you. You can write this down. The Holy Spirit is God's gift. God's gift to every Christian. So Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this. He's talking to the people of the church, Christians. He says, you are Christians, church people, you, followers of Jesus, you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And he goes on to say, remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. In other words, if our spirits have not been awakened with faith to who Jesus is, then honestly, Christ does not live in us at all. Because we ha our spirit part of us has to be awakened, and that happens when we meet the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's that answer that says, yes, I believe in you. I don't understand it all, and I, I can't quite wrap all my senses around it, but there's an element of faith that goes, I know that this is real. I know that this is good. I know that you are who you say you are, and I'm going to keep walking into that. Uh, and so the whole, it's, a, it's a gift to every Christian. So there are some who are quite fearful and avoidant of the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit, and you're like, I'm not going that Sunday. We're not talking about it. I'm not doing it. But I don't think it's truly the Holy Spirit that people are afraid of. I think it's, they're, they're afraid of people who have misrepresented the Holy Spirit. Pretended like the Holy Spirit's a cosmic force who, who has no control and is wild and crazy, and that's simply not who he is. There are people who, don't, who have misrepresented the person of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a part of the God package. <laughs> There's no way around it. It's, he's a part of the package. If you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you drew near, he drew near. And when he did, he made a deposit into your life. You can go back and you can remember your coming to Jesus story. He made a deposit into your life by sharing his spirit with you. It's the same spirit within you that cries out, Abba, Father, who quiets your heart and your mind and tells you that it's okay to draw near to the Father when you feel like you're a sinful man. And it's the Holy Spirit who, instead of normally you'd run away from the Father, you'd run away and hide, you'd run away from, from the things that are good for you. It's the Holy Spirit in you that draws you close and says, no, repent, no, confess, no, tell somebody, no, come back to me. That's the Holy Spirit. He's a part of the God package and he is good and he is for you. He's your advocate. He's your counselor and he's going to walk you into the way of truth. He's going to walk you into right living. So when you sin, you no longer run and hide, but you confess and you repent and you sense God point you in the right direction. That's the, can we, can we give the Holy Spirit some praise today? Because he is good and we are here because of his faithfulness. It's the Holy Spirit at work in your life, bringing to completion the work that God has begun in you because we can't do it on our own. Okay. And then the last thing under the Spirit's personal relationship to you is that the initial encounter with the Holy Spirit places me in God's family. You can write that down. That initial encounter places me in God's family. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. Some of us have grown up in church. Some of us, like my husband, came to know Christ as an adult. Some of us still feel like outcasts, even though we've, you know, we've given our life to Christ, but we don't know where we fit in the family of God. But in Christ, we've all been born again into the same family, and it is the Spirit who unites us. And so we submit to Him, and we submit to his leadership and his lordship, and then we become a light in the world because we live not like other people do. And so basically, in its most basic form, Holy Spirit baptism simply means to be converted or placed into the family of God or the body of Christ. That's baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, while that is a primary thing, what I'm not talking about is that Paul will contend for this, and you can read about it in 1 Corinthians and in Ephesians. He'll contend for a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's that power. Uh, that's the, the, the gifts and the, the prophecy and, and all the things. That's baptism of the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit decides who's going to get what gift based on where you're going to go in life and what he's going to call you to do. And we're not going to expand on all of that because if we, we as, as much time as we can send on the Father and as much 
time as we can spend on the Son. We could spend even more time on the person of the Holy Spirit because there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, we could be really grounded there. So in the fall, a life group is coming, and it's all about the person of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be called uh, the Holy Spirit or God within, living every day with the Holy Spirit. So if you want more information about that, keep your eyes open in the fall. A life group is coming. I'm going to be facilitating that group. I'd love to have you in it, and it'll talk about the power, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. So last thing we're going to kind of talk about is the Holy Spirit at work in my life. I want you guys to see what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. So you guys good with that? So you can write this down. The Holy Spirit affirms the Father's love for me. The Holy Spirit affirms the Father's love for me. Romans 8, 16 says, For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. You ever feel like, I don't know if God ever sees me. I don't know if God loves me. I mean, I chose God, but sometimes... I'm not sure if he sees me. It's the Holy Spirit in you that's going to affirm that you are his child. He affirms to us, not only to us, but also to his father. Nope, that's your child. And so God will begin to fight for you because the Holy Spirit is standing. He's advocating for you both in your life and with the father. And so there's an anchor for your soul that is found because of who the Holy Spirit is. Galatians 4, 6, and because we are his children, God has spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. God wants his children to call him Father. And God wants his children, his people, to be affectionate towards him as his children. God wants his people to feel comfortable and wanted in his presence. And if you feel like you have a hard time with that, can I tell you the Holy Spirit is the one to help you? Because the Holy Spirit knows that you belong in his presence. The Holy Spirit knows how much depth of love the Father has for you. And so he will minister to your heart in those places of sadness, in those places of despair, in those places of heartbreak, in those places of struggle. Because I want to draw near to God and I just don't know how. If you're open to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, he will continue to draw you in. And over time, he will reveal some things. And then you will be able to say, God is my Father. And there will be a love that you didn't have before because of the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, woohoo! The Holy Spirit reminds me that God wants me. Write that down. The Holy Spirit reminds me that God wants me. He doesn't just like, it's not just some series of things and all of a sudden like, okay, I'm in your family. And you're like, I didn't want you. <laughs> like, how'd you get in here? That's absolutely not. Ephesians 1, 13, 14 says, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. He says, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Again, we're going back to the Holy Spirit is a gift from Father God. He is a promise to us from God in essence saying to you, saying to the family of believers, I have seen your response to me, and I will not leave you on your own. Here is my gift, my promise, my deposit. I see you, I know you, I have called you by name, and I am bringing you with me. Submit to my spirit, submit to my leadership, submit to my lordship. You can trust me, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of that promise. And then the last one, the Holy Spirit empowers me with inner strength. You can write that down. The Holy Spirit empowers me with inner strength. Ephesians 3, 14 and 17. <laughs> Paul, he writes this. He says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Guys, his spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to work in our lives and he's going to bring us strength to those inner parts of us. What the Holy Spirit is going to do is he's going to bring courage for us to do the right thing. You know, when you encounter something at work or in your family and something just seems off and you don't want to voice the words you don't want to call out or bring attention to the thing that needs to be corrected, but it's the Holy Spirit who's, who's he's not going to let that sit right with you. And then he's going to give you the courage to do the right thing, even when it's hard. And then when you do do that, he's going to be so faithful on the other side of that to bless and to cover you because he is good. It's the, he's going to strengthen that inner part of us that we need, we need strengthening in. He's going to bring you self-control to refrain from doing the things that are going to damage your lives. 
when we stop and we submit and we wait and we believe that the Holy Spirit is with me and I'm not just running the race on my own, I'm not just running to get ahead, I'm not living my life in a hurry, but the Spirit of the living God is with me. He's going to help me slow down and put some self-control and some boundaries in my life and then he's going to help me to live by them because you can see that Jesus' life was marked by that. And if Jesus' life was marked by that and he was full of the Holy Spirit, you can believe that he's going to do it in our life. He's going to give us patience to wait on God's timing because we get impatient and we want it to happen right now and the Holy Spirit within you, he's going to remind you and he's going to give you peace and it's going to be okay. On the way over here, I was singing, well, <laughs> some elevation. Uh, that song, Rattle. I don't know if you guys know it. Turn it on and blast it on your way home because it's amazing. Uh, but he's talking about dry bones through the word of the Lord and he's like, God says live. That may be a different song. Anyway, but what, what he says, he says, like what happens when God says to move? What happens when God says to move? And he said, just ask this. I'm not going to sing the song. He says, just ask the guard who was standing by the tomb when Jesus died. What happens when God said to move? The guard is simply standing there minding his business. Two bright shining beings come down and they roll the tomb away and out walks a freaking dead body. What happens when God says to move the Holy Spirit? And when, when something like that happens, like there is faith, there is belief, there is hope, there is peace, there is confidence, there is assurance. And we slow down and remember the Holy Spirit. He breathes that life into us that like all of a sudden slows down our heartbeat and sets things back in order in our rattling brain. And he says, I'm with you. Do this. The Holy Spirit strengthens that inner part of us. He's going to give us wisdom to see beyond the immediacy of this moment. And he's going to give you encouragement and truth to defeat those self-defeating lies that we have picked up from the enemy. Because he is good, he is for us, he is with us, and he has things to do in our life. He's going to help us make room this is what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He's going to help us make room for Christ to sit on the throne in our hearts because that's where we want him, but sometimes we have a hard time keeping him there. And the Holy Spirit is so good. He comes back and he says, no, 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 son, no. Remember, you laid down your life. So right now, lay down your life before him again and say, Jesus, you are good, and I want you on the throne of my life. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to prompt us to do that. He's the good shepherd and he's the Lord of our lives who's going to bring about the goodness that he has promised. And so what I hope has happened here today is that we have seen clearly, a little bit more clearly, that all Christians, including yourself, have, if you've given your life to Christ, you have the Spirit personally. He's already with you. He's in you. He's for you. He is good. He's as good as God himself is good is the Holy Spirit. And I would like to close our time together simply by thanking the Holy Spirit. That's not something we do typically. We, we, we praise God the Father and we honor the Son. And normally what we do is, is we thank Jesus for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we thank Father God for his generosity and it is good and right. And so that's what we're going to do. If you would just close your eyes and bow your heads. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, I thank you that you are one God in three persons and there are facets of who you are that you have created us to relate with. Lord, and so while we may not understand it all, you have sent us your spirit, which awakens something inside of us, Lord, so that even though we don't understand, we still desire to draw near to you. And even though we don't understand because we are simple mortal beings, Lord, your spirit speaks to our spirit and you bring us into understanding. And you are so good. You have given us your spirit so that we will not be left alone as orphans. But you will transform our hearts to where we know we belong in the family of God. We are wanted by the living creator, God. We are seen and known by you. And your spirit has things for us to do. There are gifts that you desire to give us. There's a relationship that you desire to have with us. And so we give you praise for that. And we honor, we honor the Holy Spirit. And we put him in his rightful place on the throne with you, equal with you. And if there's any of us in here, you can just kind of pray this quietly in your heart, but would say, like, maybe I've kind of pushed the Holy Spirit away or I've been kind of fearful. I just didn't understand. 
And so maybe my, my, my thinking has been a little bit off, but I want to just give us an opportunity to repent for that. Father, I repent for pushing away the gift you have given to me. I ask that you would wash that sin away and you would help me to receive the gift you have given me. You would help me to see the person of the Spirit in Scripture. You would help me to have more of an understanding of the fullness of, of who the Spirit is and how He wants to work in my life. I simply receive that gift. If there's any of you still eyes closed who wants to, you want to give your life to Jesus because you haven't done that step yet. We can't receive the Spirit of the living God unless we, we put our faith in the Son of God who, who gave His life for us. And so if that's you, you can just go ahead and lift your hand up into the air and I'd love to, to celebrate and pray with you because you're coming into the family of God. Amen. I see you. Go ahead and church, just pray this with me out loud. Father God, I thank you for your Son that He gave His life for me. I repent of my sin. Come and fill me with your spirit and lead me to do what's right. In Jesus' name, amen.